Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to have the chance to introduce our first plenary speaker of the day, Carl Johan Persson, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of H&M. Today, Carl Johan is going to be speaking about H&M and its sustainability vision, incorporating industry transformation, transparency, and a living wage. I'm greatly looking forward to hearing from him, and then we'll have the chance to engage with a bit of Q&A with the audience afterwards. But before he gets started, I want to take a few minutes and really put the importance of what Carl Johan has to say in context. Because while we're all familiar with H&M, a few numbers help to frame the scope of the ambition that H&M will be laying out on stage here today. Before hearing about the sustainability of the business, let's put the business Carl Johan is leading into context. And let's do that with a few numbers. The first number is one. One CEO talking to us today. Carl Johan joined H&M in 2005 in an operational role. Five. When you think of H&M, it's actually five brands. H&M, Koss, Monkey, Weekday, Cheap Monday, and other stories. 34. Carl Johan's age when he became CEO in 2009 after heading expansion and business development starting in 2007. 55. H&M is present in 55 markets around the world, and probably just about everyone in this audience can shop in an H&M store in their home country. 1,700, the number of factories and about 700 suppliers around the world H&M buys from. 3,388, the number of global stores today, up from about 1,988 in 2009. 116,000 global employees of H&M today, up from about 53,000 in 2009. 17 billion US dollars, not including VAT, global sales in 2013, up from about 13 billion in 2009. 1.1 trillion US dollars, the estimated global apparel market in which H&M operates. So these numbers are getting bigger and bigger. Let's zoom a little bit micro again. Let's go back to two. H&M is the world's second largest clothing retailer behind Inditex. And back to one. One grandfather who founded the company in 1947 in Västerås, Sweden, selling women's clothing. I hope you hear in these numbers the narrative of one of Europe's most successful, growing, and valuable companies a company with significant direct and indirect impact on the world that operates in, and a company building, as we will hear, sustainability into its core. Let's welcome Carl Johan Persson. Thank you. Great to be here and thank you very much for inviting me to speak about H&M's commitment to uh, sustainability, to give some examples on what we do uh, and what we believe will drive positive change. My grandfather founded the company in 1947. Um, he often spoke about the importance of long-term thinking not only thinking about maximizing short-term profits, his view on that businesses have a wider responsibility than just maximizing profits. And many times before he passed away in 2002, we spoke about just that, ethical business, and he often brought up examples like he wanted to sleep well during nights, he wanted to go to stores and be able to look customers and colleagues in the eyes to and to feel, feel good about the business, that he, the business was, was run in, in, in the right way. Um, as we all know, there are a lot of uh, challenges in the world on the, both poverty and the environment um, that, we, th that we need to address. So I think it's great that you organize a conference like this, so we all get the chance to meet, um, share examples of best practice, inspire each other and learn from each other. 
Before I get into some examples on what we do, I would like to say a few words about the garment industry uh, and in particular about trade with low-wage countries. Since 1990, according to the World Bank, extreme poverty has fallen by people living in extreme poverty has fallen by some 90,000 people every day. And countries that have led the way are countries that have, have developed export industries like the garment industry. In Bangladesh, for example, people living in extreme poverty has halved since 1991. So the garment industry is a phenomenal development escalator. It's a key route out of poverty. It's creating a lot of jobs, in part particularly for women. Uh, it's often their first paid, paid job. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, very often a great driver for, for independence and, and liberation. And I'm, I'm saying it because I think it's often forgotten in the debate about the garment industry. But that being said, there are still a lot of challenges uh, connected to the, to the garment industry. Um, challenges that needs to be addressed by us, by other, other brands and by other stakeholders. We can't just lean back and be happy with the fact that there are a lot of jobs being created. So we um, watch these global, global development as, as spectators. We need to act and we need to act faster, and we have to do much more. In order to make a difference, in order to, for us, there needs to be a solid foundation in place for sustainability work, and we believe it consists of three things. First one is that sustainability work needs to be integrated into all parts of the business. It cannot be uh, an isolated function. Uh, it has to be part of all the functions, be it design or production or logistics or any function or any sales countries. They need to have sustainability goals on which they are measured and followed up on. Goals that are as important as other, other goals. Um, there needs to be a head of sustainability. That's part of the management group. In our case, it's Helena Helmersson, who is here today. Sustainability topics needs to be discussed in the boardrooms, annual sustainability reports in place. Uh, so in other words, it should be completely integrated into the business and be part of the company's uh, DNA and values. That's very important as a foundation. Secondly, we think it's very important as well to dare to take a long-term view, to do what's best for the company in the long term if long-term goals and short-term goals collide. You should do what's best for the company in the long term. And that can be really tricky, especially for listed companies, with all the pressures coming in from investors, from analysts, on delivering great quarterly results that beat or live up to the, to the expectations. Uh, but good sustainability work will require big investments. We will have to be prepared to sacrifice short-term profits for long-term profits and also trust that there is a good business case long term in doing exactly this because customers are caring more and more and colleagues are caring more and more. So we will strengthen our positions in the long term if we continue to invest in sustainability. Thirdly, um, we have to have a collaborative mindset to realize that collaboration is essential. This is not something that one company can drive in isolation. We have to work together. We are already working with other brands, but we have to do it more often. Um, so work more together with other brands, but also with other stakeholders, such as global trade unions or ILO or uh, NGOs and innovators, and to come together. And then we can compete in other fields, but work more together. All of the, this makes for a really good foundation for good sustainability work to make a difference. I would like to give many examples on what we are working on, but we don't have enough time for that, so I have limited to one example connected to the social side, one to the environmental side, and one to transparency. All three that we believe will have a big positive impact on the world. If we start with uh, an example on the social side, a really exciting project that we're working on is connected to fair living wages. Last year we launched a fair living wage roadmap. It is something that we initiated but that, that we have developed further with experts from, from the field, experts from ILO, different NGOs, global trade unions. And 
Fair living wages, as, as we all know, it's, it's a very complex issue. It's not something that one company could or, or should drive on its own. But again, it's a good example of when collaboration is needed. So based on the input from these experts, we developed a, a, a method. It's a four-way collaboration between us, between our suppliers, between the suppliers' workers, and the governments from where we source. So the starting point was to look at what, what can we do then, connected to fair living wages, apart from driving this project. And one is of course connected to, to prices. Uh, higher wages will mean higher prices. Are we prepared to pay more for that? Uh, without passing on costs uh, to, to customers? And the answer to that was yes, it already is affecting the margins, but we see it as an investment in the customer offering. And it will affect going forward as well. Sec secondly, we, we saw a potential to improve our purchasing practices, to, to have a better dialogue with the suppliers so they can plan their capacity in a better way, but also to buy more evenly or buy smarter and thus avoiding production peaks. Uh, and in doing that uh, over time, excess over time will hopefully be reduced. So that was our, our part or examples of, of what we are working on. Secondly, we're working closely with our suppliers as well. And as a starting point there, we started working with Fair Wage Network, an independent organization specializing in fair wages. Who, and we let them review several hundred of our suppliers to look into what was working and more importantly, what wasn't working. Uh, and based on that, they developed a method that we're now testing in three role model factories two in Bangladesh and one in Cambodia, where we have a five-year commitment and 100% of the capacity so we can have time to test this method. Um, I was in Bangladesh myself a month ago to visit one of these. It was really exciting. It's, it's early still, this project, but the signs are promising. Overtime has been reduced by 50%. Wages have increased. Better wage structures are in place. The dialogue between the management and workers are better, and product productivity is up. So, as I said, it's early still. We still have to, to learn more, but uh, the signs are positive, and the suppliers are also positive that it will help their uh, companies in the long term and that it will benefit the workers. And these, based on these learnings that we have in the three role model factories, we will scale, scale it up to, to, to all our strategic suppliers by 2018 uh, at the latest. The third par part was the suppliers' workers. And here we are investing heavily to, to empower the workers to, uh, to invest in, in trainings and to give them technical skills, um, to get them knowledgeable about their rights, to improve their negotiation skills, all important things as well in this um, work to improve fair living wages. And the final part is working with the governments uh, to ensure that they improve and enforce uh, labor laws and also that annual salaries are revised uh, that salaries are revised annually. Um, I've been to Bangladesh twice, met, met with the Prime Minister there, and Cambodia also met with the Prime Minister to discuss uh, these topics. So altogether, it's very exciting. During, during the last two years, uh, we have seen improvements in these markets, um, so that's great. There's still a lot to do. We're nowhere near where we should be. Uh, but it's, it's getting better, and I'm very optimistic that this uh, roadmap, a fair wage roadmap, and together with collaborating with others will make a really big difference for the coming years. On the environmental side, um, as we all know, we, um, we want to continue to grow, and in, do in doing that we have to respect uh, the planetary boundaries. The fashion industry is dependent on natural resources, and so we have to learn, uh, we have to change how fashion is made, learn to do more with less. We have to go from a linear model to a circular model and we have to do it at scale. So our approach to this was a two-step two approach. The first one was when we launched our global garment collecting initiative last year in, in all markets and in all stores where, where customers can come in, leave their garments that they no longer want, H&M garments or any other, any other brand. Um, 
and these garments will then be reused for charity or recycled. So there's no profit in it for H&M. But so far we have collected more than 8,000 tons of garments. Um, so that's really, really good. And garments not ending up on the landfill. So that was the first step. But the most exciting and important part is, is closing the loop. Getting these products or yarns or fibers back into production again. And here we are investing a lot of resources into this, both in new materials, but also in, in research and development in finding these new fibers. Um, when it comes to new materials, we, we use a lot already and we are increasing the use of recycled materials, such as uh, Tencel, for example. Uh, but the most important part, uh, the exciting part is this research and development in finding the technical solutions in getting New, in, in getting fibers that can be reused and at scale as well. And we have invested in some really exciting projects run by really good people. Same thing here, it's early, uh, early stages, but it looks really promising. We're optimistic that this will actually be something that can be scaled up. And if it is done by these projects or any other projects around the world, it will have major positive impact on the, on the environment, of course. So we're quite optimistic that these innovative people will, will uh, crack the code and it will be, um, uh, we, we will see big improvements. And one example connected to transparency. One really exciting uh, and important area is, is connected to consumer labeling. And here we are working with other brands in the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. Uh, we are working with something, something called the HIG Index. And the HIG Index is a tool to measure uh, apparel uh, and footwear products, brands and suppliers on the sustainability performance. Uh, and it takes the entire value chain in, into account from raw materials to end of life solutions. So, what the, what, and we hope it will be connected then to, to, a, to a labeling on the product. So when the customer comes into a store, sees a product, likes, looks at the design, uh, the quality, the price, uh, tries it on to see the fit, but will also have a label showing the sustainability performance connected to that product. Uh, so they, they can make a more informed uh, buying decision. And in doing that, it will put great pressure on us companies, of course, to do more because we want to have a great customer offering. So uh, this is what would be really groundbreaking. I think it, it will happen. It will be really groundbreaking when it happens and it will lead to a lot of pressure on companies and companies will do much more. So th this is really promising as well. Just to conclude then, we, we want to continue to, to grow. Um, and in doing that, we have, to, we have to respect the planetary boundaries. And in doing that, we also have to realize that customers will care more and more. Colleagues will care more and more about company sustainability work, and rightly so. So when we put our resources into sustainability work, we see it as an investment in, getting the cost, in improving the customer offering. We also see, in a, see it as, as an investment in becoming an even more attractive employer. And we want customers and, and colleagues or people when they shop or work at H&M to be proud about that, uh, to know that we're conscious about what we're doing and that we take our responsibilities seriously. I have given three examples. One is uh, on things that we know will make a big difference. One is connected to the fair living wages. One is uh, around um, uh, uh, HIG index, uh, the consumer labeling, one is connected to closing the loop. And as a foundation for good work, we believe it is very essential to integrate sustainability into the whole business, to have a collaborative approach, work with other brands and stakeholders, and also to dare to do what's best for the company in the long term. Um, as I said, my grandfather founded H&M, so I feel very passionately about, about H&M and I, of course I care about the quarterly profits as well but I have a, have a long term perspective on, on H&M and think about future generations of, of colleagues and customers and just as he did I want to feel pride when we 
look at what we do now when, 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 I, when I look back at my time at H&M about what we achieved that, and also that we gave customers great value for money, great designs, but also that we had a positive impact uh, on the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Where do you want me? So thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating, and there's some great questions that come from that. Uh, I'll start off with a couple of questions. Um, for folks who'd like to tweet at us, it's hashtag AskBSR14, and they'll be transmitted up to me over here. Uh, we'll also come out into the audience for questions as well in just a second or two. Uh, but maybe I'll start with one. So the fair living wage is absolutely important. It's important for workers to allow them to invest in themselves, invest in their future lives. Uh, we need progress. We need more progress even faster. But the story you're telling us is one of your trading margin for workers' wages. That is truly long-term view. How did you get support? Where does support sit? That's a fundamentally transformative decision. Yeah, it is, but it goes back to what what I said earlier. I think it's it's in the it's a good business case for it. Uh, we have a long-term view at H and M. We have always had that, although we want to deliver good good quarterly results as well. But we always choose what's best for the company in the long run. And customers are caring more and more. Colleagues are caring, um, and in doing that, we will strengthen the customer offering, uh, even though it's costing in the short term. Um, and it also is the right thing to do. But when we source from other markets, we look at several things. Of, of course, price is important. That's one thing we look at. We also look at quality. Uh, we want long-term relationship with the suppliers. Uh, we look at sustainability work. We could lower the cost by going somewhere else and having lower expectations on quality or sustainability work. But wherever we are, wherever we decide to source from, we want good sustainability performance from, you know, from us, from suppliers, and from the countries. So another key question of the apparel industry, on one hand, it, it does create jobs. It creates immense jobs around the world. Those jobs create employment and income and wealth. And the other side of it is sometimes the apparel industry has a reputation for you know, lowest cost labor. Right? So right now we're thinking Myanmar, Ethiopia even. How does this continue, and how do you balance those? It is a balance by looking at several things. As I said, pr price is important. It's for us, it's for other brands, it's in all industries when you look at sourcing. But it's not only that. It's about the sustainability work as well. It's about the lead times. We want the proximity to, to the selling markets. So we're sourcing from countries in Europe as well. Uh, it's about long-term relationships, uh, capacity, and so on. So it, we have to have a look at all those things. And when prices go up, like they're doing now in Bangladesh, it's not like we're, we're, we're leaving. We're still staying there. We're growing in Bangladesh. We're paying higher prices. But we are a growing company, so we're looking at more markets. Um, I see it as very, very good. I mean, if you, these examples, Myanmar and Ethiopia, it's a great opportunity for them to, uh, it's what, exactly what's needed to create jobs, to get the economies growing. Many years ago, we sourced from Sweden, we sourced from the UK. Those countries have moved on now to different, uh, different industries, and um, so it's, it's a, I think it's, it's good. Okay. But we have to do it in a responsible way, of course. Absolutely. And so then the other question is, H&M uh, is the world's second largest apparel uh, retailer, and yet it's a $1.1 trillion industry. How do you change the rest of the industry? How do you take a, H&M's work and get others to follow, to lead, to embed, cooperate with others. How do you drive that change? Well, I, I think we are, we're doing a lot of good things at H&M. We're not alone. In the, there are many other brands, many uh, sure are here today that are doing wonderful things connected to sustainability. And we are collaborating on a lot of initiatives like the HIG Index, Better Cotton Initiative, Fire and Building Safety Agreement. Um, yeah, the, the fair wage roadmap. Uh, so there are many examples of, of where we collaborate, uh, as, but it should be more. It should be more. Excellent. So actually, maybe I'll take the first question from uh, Twitter. And uh, after that, we'll come back to the floor. And this comes from uh, Amanda Bowman. 
um, which also links to the question that our CEO Aaron has been asking to uh, all the other CEOs out there, which is this question of the omnipotent CEO, right? Um, because you said it, does everybody follow? Or how do you ensure that your employees and leaders actually engage in your three issues of integrating, collaborating, and long-term thinking? How does that cascade into H&M as an organization? Well, it's part of, um, I mean, the soft, soft parts as well. It's part of the company values that we speak a lot about. It's part of the culture, and we talk about it, and we want pe people who live the values every day. So that's one thing. And then we also, in a bit more of the, the hard, hard things, we have it in the goals. So all functions and all countries have sustainability goals that, are, that they are measured on. And then connect, that connects also to, to the values, of course, is to recruit the right people and to keep the right people, not only with great drive and delivering good results, but with, uh, with good values as well, with a good heart, and all, all of that connects, uh, comes together nicely. Great. Okay, so let's go out and ask some questions. Uh, we would like to emphasize questions do mean questions. Uh, statements and uh, long diatribes, are uh, we prefer not to have them. Uh, so uh, we do have some mic runners out there. They're standing up. If you have a question, please raise your hand. So how about right over here in the front? Thank you very much. Anna, uh, please introduce yeah. yourself. Sure. Oh, great. Thank you very much. My name is Tiffany Frankie. I'm a sustainability researcher and also working with a tech collaborative engagement platform. Um, I was really excited to hear about the, the closed loop initiatives that you have going, especially um, because with fast fashion um, and designs that are meant to be value for money for the, the consumer. I feel that having a, a, a way of recycling the clothing is very important, yet still, I think only a percentage can be actually recycled. Um, and of course, there's energy that goes into recycling those garments. So I'm, I'd love to hear how you're thinking about incorporating more long-lasting design, durable, high quality into the actual design of the product and how that's factoring into your sustainability plans. Yep. Um, I, I completely agree. It's, it's um, necessary that we find a way of, get, of, of closing the loop. That's why we are investing so much into these new exciting projects that we believe can be scalable. And in also some cases we are collaborating with other companies to, in, in that to, to, get it, uh, to get it scalable. Um, and then we are using more and more recycled materials. We have our goals of 100% sustainable cotton by 2020, and we're increasing that every year. And when, you, when, when, when we speak about fast fashion, we want to make fashion affordable for, for all people, but we, don't, we want to do it with good quality as well. So the people is not throw away fashion, but they last for a long time. Uh, so that we are investing a lot in, and we also want to, at the same time as at, do, and at doing that, we want to we want to do a great sustainability work as well. But the, but the major thing connected to to fast fashion and to to low prices and all the energy and the use of natural resources is in cracking the code and finding. Uh, finding a way to get the fibers back into production. I'm optimistic about it, but it's, it's still, of course, uh, it's early days. And then I think also when we speak about consumption, I think consumption is good as well because it drives the economy, it drives uh, all the welfare th things, it creates a lot of jobs. So I don't think the right way is to consume less of everything, and that could have, have quite bad consequences on the economy and poverty and all of that, but it's continue to consume, but do it from companies that are responsible um, and, and innovating a lot from us, from, from countries to find ways to how can we continue to grow, but do, yeah, do more with less, really, so. Do more, do less, maybe faster. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Other questions uh, out? Yes, right up here in the front. We have a mic. Uh, well, we'd like everybody to be able to hear, so hold on. It's coming right up front. 
and think about your questions in the meantime. We'll probably have a couple more after this. Uh, hello, I'm David Walden from Barclays. First of all, congratulations. I think it's wonderful what you're doing. Do you find this a source of competitive advantage? And if so, where and what differences do you see around the world? Uh, yeah, around the world in what? Well, in different countries. I, I guess what, what I'm interested in is the consumer pull for what you're doing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's part of the customer offering. Uh, I mean, it's the designs, the quality, the price, but also the sustainability work. We think it is more of an advantage in the long term. Today, um, I don't think that many uh, customers, to be honest, are, are prepared to pay more. We don't charge more, for example, for when we have organic cotton, even though it's costing us more. So again, it's an example of where we are investing because we believe it's the right thing uh, for the future. Uh, we see that the interest is there, that is growing all the time, and that's not going to stop. It will continue to grow. Customers will are caring more and more, and colleagues as well. Um, and we see, so it is, yeah, a slight competitive advantage in working with it today, but it will become even more in the future. Uh, we see more interest in developed economies. Um, Northern Europe, um, UK, uh, US, uh, but it's growing in all markets. Okay. Other questions? How about right over here in the front left? Stage left. And uh, also, please introduce yourself, ma'am. My name is Anna Meyer, and I'm with Verizon Wireless. Um, I'm interested to learn more about your eco label for your uh, garments. Uh, two questions. One is, based on your demographics and who your customer is, what marketing research have you done um, that they actually value that data? And that would be a decision-making factor into their purchase. And the second question is, what criteria are you using and what are you putting on the label? Is it water, energy, fiber, carbon? Yep. Thank you. Uh, we have two things. We have, that can be interesting to, to mention as well. We also developed a, a care label, a new care label in the products together with Ginetex uh, so that the consumers uh, or customers can be think about washing more responsibly and so on. But uh, what we spoke about earlier, the, the HIG index, is um, it's not yet fully developed. It's a work in progress. It's really exciting. Um, and, and the idea is to have a label what exactly will be in it is not yet, it's not yet finalized, but it will cover th everything, the entire value chain from the raw materials to the end of life solutions. It will be both on the environment side and on the social side. So different KPIs that are easy to, to understand for the customers and then maybe also connected to that. I'm, I'm not, it's not yet decided, but that you can scan the Kimball and get more information about the companies total sustainability work or more detailed information about that exact product. But we'll see when it will happen, but uh, I'm convinced, but uh, it's not yet there. And, and to take the first part of that question. Did ah, you... sorry, the marketing research, I don't know. I'm not, it will, I have to check with my colleagues about who, the work in the sustainable apparel co coalition, exactly what has gone into it. But a lot of work and a lot of uh, enthusiasm, but exact market research, I don't know. Okay. Other questions? How about right over here? I might have just uh, violated BSR policy by taking the microphone, but apologies. Carl Johan, thank you so much for your comments. I'm Eric with BSR. And I'd really love it, and I think people in the audience um, would benefit from having you unpack this statement, which I found um, really interesting. You know, when, we're, when we face pressure between the near term and the long term, we just choose the long term. And I know for certain if I started a meeting with that suggestion at most places that I work, it would be a very short conversation. What are the tools? Are there tools? Is it just you know, adamant top-down leadership, or are there things you've developed in terms of hurdles or anything else that helps your people who are under a lot of pressure to deliver to take those courageous decisions? How does it work? Uh, 
Well, it, go, yeah, it goes back to what I, what, I, what I said earlier. One, one is that it's part of the company, should be part of the company culture, the values to, to have that mindset. It is at H&M. It's been like that for, from, from the very start. We are in a way, we are listed, but in a way a family company as well, and we have a long-term perspective. So that, that helps uh, in having that culture. Um, and then it's also in the goal setting, not only set goals that are connected to delivering the short term results, but have goals that are connected to sustainability work and with the longer, um, longer time perspective. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what, what I think. Okay. I think we have time for maybe one, maybe two questions. I think we see one all the way in the far corner back there. We're making our mic runners really run today. Okay. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Momo from a CSR uh, network in Israel. Um, I want to follow up on consumption. Uh, you mentioned uh, you don't follow the uh, buy less, but I'm sort of interested in the trends here. If you talk to the food and beverage industry, they are talking about the fact that they can sell less in quantity, but need to offer higher uh, value. So do we see any trends of that sort in the apparel industry? Are we sort of facing more uh, growth in consumption in the Western world? Sort of interested in, in that, thanks. So, sorry, I didn't follow. Can you say, can you say again? Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that uh, if you speak to the food and beverage uh, industry, they are mentioning the fact that they can sell in a way they need to grow uh, in terms of offering more value rather than more quantity. Um, and, and there were some decades of growth in, 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 in volume. So now it's value. So is the apparel industry in sort of any trends around that? Thank you. So taking the idea of, maybe it links back to fast fashion. To yeah. Thinking longer term value, thinking longer term quality of product. What do you see the trends? Uh, as we see, we see that trend that it's more uh, a lot of companies growing in the low price and a lot of companies doing well, so-called fast fashion companies, so that, that is growing. But when we look at ourselves, what we want to do is offer customers um, good designs, affordable, good quality. We, wa we want to invest and we are investing in improving the quality, so other in other words, that the products should last longer. And all the investments that we spoke about now into the sustainability work, we see part of the quality as well. So we think it's possible to do both, to offer uh, low prices and to have good quality and good, do good sustainability work. So taking that same topic, and this is a question that came from John Friedman from Sodexo. So in the apparel industry, the low price question also somewhat links to the industry and the ability of the industry to think about fair living wage and pay wages. Uh, is there a disincentive there between what customers want to pay and the ability of you and or others to pay living wages and to get more money into the hands of actual factory workers? Yes, but what, what, one thing that should be remembered as well is also that, I mean, we we use the same suppliers as many, many companies, and some are in the mid-price segment and some on the high-price segment. So regardless of when you look at the price of a product, uh, it doesn't say much about the actual salary for, for the workers. Um, but of course, as I said earlier, with, with pushing for higher wages like we are, we have to be prepared to pay higher prices. We're not charging the customers more. So it's, it's affecting margins. And that's part of the sustainability work, just as it is with, with using more sustainable materials. It's costing us more. Yep. Customers are not yet prepared to pay for it. It's affecting margins. Um, and we believe it's the right thing to do, even though it's costing more today. But then it's always a balance. We want to stay competitive, of course. If we're not competitive, we cannot do good sustainability work. If we don't do good sustainability work, we cannot be competitive because customers will like us less and colleagues will like us less. So it's all, it's all connected. Yes, it's an iterative, ongoing process. Yeah, yeah. I think we there was to. one question right over here, and that will be the last question then. Hi, Josh Mailman from Serious Change. So I actually have two. The first one is, we, there's an example, there's three major European companies, UCNA, IKEA, uh, all family owned, 
didn't go public and exemplifying values of leading a company into the next generation. So can, com can companies in the public market be like you? Or is the answer that if you want to preserve values, you, you really have to stay uh, private? And the second question is, what about materials beyond cotton? Can, 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 you, move, can you move into other materials like, uh, like hemp or linen or stuff like that that itself is more sustainable on the land? Yeah, the f first question, we are a listed company, although we, uh, the family is still involved. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, I think it's, it is tricky with all the pressures from the, from the stock market, from investors, from analysts to, to deliver great uh, results quarterly. Uh, there's too much short-term thinking, but we have to stand up to that pressure and, and do what's best for the, for the company in the long term. I think we manage it well at H&M. Um, Non-listed companies like IKEA, for example, is doing a wonderful job. And, and I think it helps not being listed. Um, but I'm sure, I mean, there are many other examples of companies doing well that are listed. So it, it's possible. It's just put, having that mindset, getting in the, in the culture, recruiting the right people, setting the right goals that are not only connected to short-term results. So yes, I think it's possible, but it's more, it's more difficult. Uh, second part, we are increasing use of materials all the time, not only of cotton of, or organic cotton, better cotton uh, initiative uh, cotton. Uh, we are increasing the use of recycled materials like Tencel and um, many other materials. So it's, it's growing. Great. So on that note, what I'd like to do is to uh, bring this conversation to a close. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Carl Johan for the time. Very much appreciated. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.